Hello, welcome to episode 101 of the Online Tennis Podcast. Today we are talking the Wimbledon final. Marketa von Drosova, of course. Spoilers. One against Ons Jabeur in the final. I'm here to talk about it with John Selk. How are you doing, John? Long time no see. Yes, we were just on Talking Tennis, watching the match together. Pretty rocky affair. Where do we start here, John? I think there. this is a tale of... Two stories, right? Um, there's Marketa von Drusova's victory and there's certainly Ons Jabeur's loss. Which should we unpick first? What do you think? Uh, let's go with von Drusova as the winner. Um, I mean, she'd won three matches on grass before this tournament began and had won zero before this year. You know, there's probably since she's 24 years old, I believe. So, you know, you have a few grass court seasons there and a few early exits at tournaments. I saw her get one of those grass court wins in Berlin this year. I did not think I would be watching the Wimbledon winner a few weeks later. I think there were other contenders at that tournament that were certainly ahead of her in the in the likelihood. But um, yeah, unbelievable run. You can't fault her. I think she can play better too. And that obviously leads us to one or two questions about her opponent too. But I'm sure you want to elaborate on Von Drusova. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Let's just start with a little bit of background. There, are, there will be people listening who don't know much about Von Drusova. She is now the first unseeded woman, woman to win Wimbledon, by the way, in the Open Era. But prior to this, four years ago, she made the French Open final in 2019. Two years ago, she made the Olympics final in 2021. And she was kind of derailed with left wrist injuries. Of course, she's a lefty. Came back from surgeries last year and kind of just out of nowhere wins this title at Wimbledon because, as you alluded to, she's not won many matches on grass before in her career. She said herself she came here expecting to win a couple of matches and now she's the Wimbledon champion. Okay. And there's loads of reasons why this happened, but I think we could kind of delve into the, the route, certainly to the, the title, because it is very impressive. I mean, start off the week, the first week, she defeated both of our picks for the final. John, as we've mentioned a few times now, eh? she defeated Vekic, who I had in the final, Kudermetova, who you had in the final. Both of those players great on grass, and Von Drosova beat them in straight sets. Those two wins probably stand out to me as the most impressive wins of the whole route. The one match I would like to point to, though, where Von Drosova maybe should have lost was the Pegula match. Oh, yeah. Because after the Pegula match, I would say her both her opponents were pretty nervy. We're going to get all into this, obviously, with the Jabir match up in a second. But the Pegula match was definitely, I mean, it was 4-1, 30-40. She was close to going out. I just want to point out that a game before, the roof was closed. Yep. And because the roof was closed, it becomes a little easier for Von Drosova to A, serve, Mm -hmm. but B, start using that forehand, which I will expand on that because... Von Drosova's best strength for me is that lefty forehand. It pins people into the backhand corner. If she can hit it over and over again, it becomes very difficult to control or get out of that kind of backhand jail. And when the roof was closed, conditions get a little bit slower. It's a little bit easier for Von Drosova to keep finding that backhand of Pegula. It came at the perfect time. Pegula, I think, if the roof had been open, probably would have been in a Wimbledon semi final. And the way those two matches played out, we could have seen Pegula win the title, John. Yeah, um, there's also a momentum thing as well. She was down a break. Uh, the person who's more likely to benefit from a break in the in the momentum or in the play, if you like, is going to be the one who's behind. She regrouped. Perhaps uh, you're right that the closing of the roof gave her a small advantage. And of course, the roof was closed today. I think controversially in a way because the weather was okay. I don't know if it's dry. I say stay with the roof open, but there we go. She, But you're right, 30-40 on her serve, threatening to be a double breakdown, and then she wins five games in a row. If you were to pinpoint her Wimbledon victory, if you like, it probably would be those five games, or, as you point out, the tough rounds two and three, because although they were straight sets wins, they're not even banana skins. She's probably not the favourite going into both of those matches. And she overcame them. And perhaps that was the first sign that something was happening. Something special was happening. Yeah. Uh, she won both those matches again on her forehand merits. Those two players, they are good servers. 
but they were struggling to get out of that backhand jail again. Certainly from the quarterfinals onwards, those wins were, you know, there's other stuff going on, but still very impressive. But let, let's delve into that a bit. But so the, the semi final she played against Lena Svitolina. That certainly could have been a little bit better from Svitolina. She was a little nervy, a little exhausted after, you know, obviously she's been through so much, having given birth, and she comes to this tournament as a wild card. She gets through four Grand Slam champions, and she's in the semi-finals, and she's still got two matches to go to get a title. So I'm not surprised she was a little bit out of gas. It could have been a harder semi-final, I think, if it had been against Iga. Who knows, John? Certainly that's not the greatest matchup in, by any means. I, I think the, the draw certainly open, opened up in a way, the last two matches maybe. I mean, it, it had the potential to open up, bearing in mind Iga was the main threat, I would suggest, in, in that half of the draw. She was the one that had the pedigree, if not on grass, but certainly Grand Slam pedigree and certainly recent Grand Slam pedigree, whereas the other half was stacked. I mean, the fact that we had Jabur in that half along with Rybakina and Sabalenka and I guess Madison Keys, who made it to the quarters as well. And there was probably one or two others that I'm forgetting. That was the stacked half. And in a way, I think many of us would have said at the beginning of the tournament, the winner is coming from that half. And you'd have probably put 80 or 90% chance on that. But maybe the fact that, that Shabur had to come through those unbelievable matches where she was the underdog going in and the underdog, certainly when she's a breakdown in the third set to... Uh, Savalenka in the semi-final, I think it was 4-2. But she prevails in those, and in a way, they were her finals. And maybe that had an effect. I don't know, what did she say in her press conference, Jabir, by the way? Jabir was very unhappy with her own game. She mm -hmm. mentioned the backhand in particular, which I was talking about a lot and talking tennis, way too many unforced errors. Mm -hmm. We need the backhand to be pretty special against Von Drosova because again that's the only way you counter that lefty forehand it's got so much spin so much work I remember at the Billie Jean King Cup last year which was in Glasgow of course Daniel Collins talking about it afterwards mentioned how heavy that ball is how difficult it is to break free of that and Collins has got like the best backhand genuinely one of the best backhands in the world so if she's obviously got problems with it anybody's got problems with it for sure so maybe a little bit of credit to Von Drosova, but there was some setters, John, where the backhand just wasn't working. And I mean, from 4-2 up, right, from 4-2 up, she lost 24 of the next 27 points. Yeah, I remember that spell quite well. I didn't know the exact stat, um, but I knew it was about 90%. Um, and that's a, an incredible swing in the match. And it was the deciding factor, I think, in the end. I know you can point to the fact that Jabot was a, another breakup, but that's the, the chunk of the match where it, it got away from her. What do you think about Vanch's suggestion as well, that she was a bit predictable on serve, almost always going to the backhand? He highlighted it when we spoke earlier. I mentioned it to Vanch already, to be okay. fair. I think sometimes... I can get a little bit bogged down in stats. Vance gets a little bit bogged down in stats. I think that's one of those ones where Vance is trying to give Shibura a little bit of tactical credit when really the story of the match, for me, was nerves because mm -hmm. she should have done better today. And it doesn't matter how many times she's serving to the forehand or backhand. For me today, it was about how well she was playing under pressure. Those come from behind wins in the quarterfinal and semi final. Of course, she's going into them. First of all, it's not the final. Secondly, she's not the favourite. Thirdly, she's behind on the scoreboard and fighting and fighting her way back into the match and then ultimately winning in, in unbelievable style. Today, there was a lack of style and finesse that, that she so desperately needs and so often shows. And I think, as, as she has also basically confessed to, that. She was a long way from her best, and she was just bogged down. I mean, the, the weather here in Germany, and I think it's very similar in London, it's just very close. It's just very heavy, and I felt, you know, that just mirrored uh, the way she was playing. She just never got going. Sorry to interrupt, guys. If you are enjoying the video, a quick like and a quick subscribe would go a long way. Thanks very much. Let's talk about pressure a bit, John, because that... For me, is the story of the match. You're touching on it there. She never really got going. I mentioned it at the start of your broadcast on Talking Tennis. I was saying, you know, if Shabur plays well, if she's not nervy, she'll win this matchup, right? Yeah. And I can get into that in a second. 
But let's talk about the fact she was nervous. She didn't perform as well as she could have. What happened? Gil's tweet, Gil Gross's tweet was perfect. I mean, Ons was in a pressure cooker, he said. Playing an unseated player, major final scar tissue. Knowing Wimbledon is her best chance at 28 years old. She looked like she was nervy from about 4-2. It all kind of caught up with her. She -hmm. started getting angry that her forehand was spraying. You know, she said in her press conference she felt a lot of pressure, felt a lot of stress. And of course she did. I mean, she's got the weight of Africa, the Arab world, on her back, you know, on her shoulders. And this was her match to lose, I guess. You know, it was her match to win. It was her match to lose. Whatever happened, Von Drosova went in there. It's interesting because, like, I'll talk about the matchup very quickly, John, and I'll get your thoughts. Because Von Drosova's forehand into Jabur's backhand that should work on a grass court. You know, Jabur changes direction very well, phenomenally, in fact, one of the best players in the world at doing it, and her slice is great. As soon as they started slicing against each other, Jabur was the favourite every single time. So she she should be one of the few players that can get out of that kind of jail, right? But what started to happen, there was no backhand consistency whatsoever. There was no slices. She didn't even go for variety that much, actually. Yep. I feel like she was quite pushy, quite stale, a lot of that comes down to her forehand and backhand technique, by the way, which the grip is very continental, so they're very sort of flat balls. It's actually funny because against the power players in the previous rounds, she almost preferred the ball getting hit hard at her, like incredibly hard at her, because she can redirect it with that flat sort of grip. But as soon as she had to create her own pace, it was a lot more nervy, a lot more shaky. She actually said, now this is probably the quote I found most interesting from the press conference, she actually said, Marquette had just put the ball in. She just, she just, she just put the ball in. She mm. slices a lot. I believe that was completely different from the last three matches they played together, she said. And maybe adapting to her rhythm was very difficult for her. Von Drosova conversely said, I think I just kept my nerves together, just stayed calm. I think there was a spell in the match when Marquetta was aware of the errors coming off um, of Onze's racket. I think also her decision making, there was a couple of times she chose to go for the drop shot. And I'm like, wow. Uh, there was a couple of times, even towards the end of the match, when she went big uh, on shots. And I'm thinking, you're up in the rally here. I'm not suggesting that the Marquetta would have broken down. As as she said, she was playing pretty solidly. She can play a lot better. Maybe she was, Marquetta was just going, oh, Ons is um, feeling it right now. From from 4-2 until pretty much the end of the match, Ons is feeling it right now. All I have to do is play a normal game and it will come to me. And And it just, normally in tennis, you have to go over the line. And with the exception of her obviously serving it out, I think it just came to Marquette. It was a strange match in many ways to watch unfold. You're absolutely right saying that because actually Jabur said herself, or that's that's what she was alluding to, the press, um, the journalist in the press conference had heard Jabur mention that Von Drosova played the right game for that final. That, and they, they asked her to elaborate and that's when she said mm-hmm. she just kept the ball in. So 100% it was a low quality final. There's no way, yeah. you know, that is the best Von Drosova can play. There's no way... That Jabir, that's the best Jabir can play. It's actually funny, Jabir also mentioned that the fact she played Rabakin and Sabalenka in the previous rounds potentially completely screwed with her rhythm. It was a, mm-hmm. and, Kvitova, and Kvitova, those three players, huge hitters of the ball for three different rounds, right? That's a whole week without playing this kind of matchup. Yeah, and just the, the, the nature of those se- second two in particular, but maybe even the Kvitova one as well, which was a mightily impressive straight sets win. Um, also today, uh, probably, possibly the most significant stat is she threw in more uh, unforced errors in this match than she did in any of the previous six. And bearing in mind this match was straight sets, that's even more significant. Bearing in mind you would think that over three sets, just statistically, you're going to produce more unforced errors than you should over two. Yeah. So yes, I, I think it's 32 uh, unforced errors altogether, although I have seen 31 as well. But either way, it's it's unfortunately too many if you want to win a Wimbledon title. <laughs> By any means, of course. And um, I think that's as much as I'd peel the match back. It's quite a difficult one to stomach, even as a neutral. Um, you obviously, we obviously wanted Jabur to eventually get over the line, whether it's Von Drosova on the other side of the net, whoever it is. She's been in two finals before. It's going to take her 
a massive monumental effort to get herself in this position again yeah it does feel like a very very tough one to stomach she did say of course immediately afterwards the most painful defeat of her career so it's going to be very tough let's talk the future for these two i'm very interested in your thoughts john does javur bounce back I mean, she's going to be here for a while yet. She's 28, soon to be 29. She's going to be there or thereabouts when it comes to titles, maybe even some of the bigger titles. But of course, the biggest, the four Grand Slams. I'm, along with the consensus, I think, of of many other tennis experts, is it is Wimbledon or bust. I I, I don't see... um, you know, a deep, deep run this particular September in New York. and Or at least I don't see her getting through uh, Rybakina and Sabalenka and potentially Sviontek. Of course, it depends on how the draw pans out. You know, maybe a resurgent Krejcikova as well on a hard court, I think, is, is, is a much different proposition to what it would be on grass. Um, who knows that the 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 changing of the guard in in women's tennis i mean it's a constantly evolving thing but those three players i think are going to be here for some time and that's why i suggested earlier that I, I even if ons had won today it would have been an amazing moment and you and i were probably a little bit more desperate for it because we knew it was a now or never moment so in answer to your question um we might have to wait at least 12 months and then we'll see where we're at she's just got a peak for i don't think it's quite the same as as somebody such as a berrettini or perhaps a Kyrgios on the men's side who just need to make sure they peak for wimbledon maybe she can get to a french open final if the draw opens up but it, it it's a it's a sad day because i think many of us felt that this was the one going into that final having had a couple of you know tough defeats in finals in the past but this was the one where it was there 29 as i say very soon and Regarding von Drusova, though, the, the the future could be anything between we don't see her again for another four years in in a in a in a in a Grand Slam final, if you like, or it could be the beginning of of something quite special in that she's regularly getting to quarters, semis, and and maybe even finals at the biggest tournaments. I also felt though for von Drusova, not now or never, but I also thought this is your moment. You know, you've you've maybe got to take it as well. And maybe she felt that too and uh, adjusted her game to thinking, I've just got to win this match because you don't know in tennis. I mean, I, I hope for Ons that there's a, a Jana Novotna style happy ending. I see some parallels between those two, but you just don't know. I'm, I'm very impressed that she came back. I'm impressed with one or two other players that do the same, but I fear the worst. There was an element of the draw opening up Slightly for Von Drosova, for sure, as we've touched on, right? And where Jabur probably isn't going to get through those power players on hard courts, I also don't think Von Drosova will either. But right. I do think if those aforementioned players were to get knocked out, Von Drosova is more likely to take advantage on any in any slam than Jabur is. Um, I think her game's incredibly steady. It's very difficult to counter. That's why she came through this draw against pretty big hitters. Not the biggest hitters, but pretty big hitters. And actually, the balls were very slow. That's not normal okay. for Wimbledon. I think when the conditions are a little slower, it definitely benefits Von Drosova. That's not going to be the case in Australia. It's not going to be the case at the US Open. The French, unfortunately, Iga reigns supreme. There's no way Iga doesn't get through that matchup, I'm afraid. So... It'll be interesting, but my gut feeling says this is probably a one slam wonder. Even if Vondrosa was in the semis every well, so often, yeah. mm. even if she makes deep runs every so often, I, I doubt it's going to happen again. I, I agree. And so, therefore, there was an element of despite. The only reason I think many of us were slightly erring towards Ons, or maybe a bit more than slightly, just in terms of the, the desperation for the result to occur, is because because of her age and because of the expectation and because of what happened a year ago. And of course, the fact that, you know, she could open, open up, you know, vast new channels for the sport. Um, one thing though, in terms of draws opening up, this Wimbledon draw opened up on the Thursday before the tournament began. That's when it opened up for anyone in that top half of the draw. I, I, I don't see a draw opening up in the same way uh, elsewhere, because there's, especially on the hard courts in, in New York and, and Melbourne, because there's a reason why these are the big three. We're calling them that a little bit. And with, with every tournament, it's gathering pace. And the reason is, 
is they, they, they're they there in the quarters, in the semis, in the finals, just constantly. I mean, even this tournament where Iga goes out in the quarters, it's grass. You know, that's still a, a good run for her compared to where she was a year ago. Sabalenka, Rybakina are there in the quarters, even if Rybakina was a bit under under the weather going into the tournament. And she, they're just there all the time. It's not that they're going out early anymore. Sabalenka is not going out in round two. Rybakina is not going out in round three. Iga's not going out in the first week of any of these tournaments, even on grass. The jaws, a bit like in the men's on the men's side, as it used to be with their so-called big three, they're not opening up anymore. And that's the problem that pretty much everyone else in women's tennis has to face. That's a very good way of putting it, John. And yeah, I, that, that, that's why I'm going to stand by that. I don't think Vladrosa was going to win in our slam. That's the reason why, if it were a, a, on a natural surface, you've got players like Shabua that can kind of cause an upset and maybe the draw puts up. But my overarching point is, John, this Wimbledon title run fell the way of Marquetta in every way possible um, and credit to her for winning it but yeah she had to she had to beat the player in front of her but it was a pretty good draw definitely yeah just those first two I mean like those first two in that first week that we mentioned rounds two and three that was it you know and and uh, at least on paper I would say they were the with the exception of perhaps Ons in the final they were the most difficult ones. Now, that's not to say that there weren't trickier obstacles to come in, especially that Pagula match, and also she had a three-set match in the match before. So you could, you know, you, somebody watching or listening right now go, oh, but what about those? That's true. But going into those two matches, I felt good for Von Drusova. It was the second and third round. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, so I shout out to Buzkova, who I hadn't actually mentioned. Yeah, she, yeah, she, right. She could have been an issue. She um, could have done. I mean, I think there was a, 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 she was one love up and had a break point in the third set as well. So, yeah, she could have been, but it was it was rounds two and three for me. Yeah, definitely. Let's um, try and end on a positive for Jabua. There, she said she's going to come back. She's going to come back stronger. She believes it. She believes in destiny. She said in the past, you know, she she took the Wimbledon loss last year very well. She did say it was very painful, but she's also mentioned she's willing to bounce back. Of course, talking to Kim Clijsters afterwards who had to go through four slam finals before she won her first one. She said, I love Kim so much, a great inspiration for me. They were, had a, shared a hug after the final, apparently. She's got a lot of support on her side. It could be done at Wimbledon, as you mentioned, John. Who knows? Let's see. Yeah, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, exactly. Right, we'll close up there. Thanks very much, guys, for joining me. Uh, catch John, please, on Talking Tennis and Twitter, of course, at JSIL. Please give us a like and a subscribe if you're listening on YouTube. Thanks very much for joining us on the Online Tennis Podcast. We'll catch you next time. Cheers. Cheers.